Um, and Luther also rejects, uh, he rejects saints, he rejects celibacy for the priesthood, um, and a lot of other stuff, right? Anything else come to mind right now? Okay, so, now many people are inspired by, Christian, or by Luther's idea. Now Luther is condemned to the diet at Worms. W-O-R-M-S, worms, right? The diet at worms. He's condemned. He must stop speaking. But there are many princes that side with Luther, that see in Lutheran's reformed religion a potential way to increase their power against the Catholic Roman Church that has, you know, all of these restrictions on what they can do and that's taking all this money from their territory and tithes and bringing it down to Rome. And they also see a way to emphasize their power against the Holy Roman Emperor, who's Catholic, and whose job it is, as Holy Roman Emperor, his job is to defend the Holy Roman Catholic Church. And so this is a way to undermine the Holy Roman Emperor's power, is by taking up this new religion. And so one of these princes, Frederick III, Elector of Saxony, protects Martin Luther from the edict at Worms, the edict that's, that's issued after the Diet at Worms. And Luther then, therefore, is protected in Saxony. He's able to translate the Bible to German. He's able to write all these uh, treatises that will then be spread across Germany using the printing press, and therefore, his ideas will spread. Now, one of his ideas is about the freedom of a Christian, that there's no outside authority that ultimately determines truth, except the individual conscience, informed by reading the Bible. And so Christians have freedom. Now, for many people, this is a very exciting idea. And many poor people view this notion of Christian freedom or Christian liberty as not just applying to spiritual matters, but also applying to their social world. And these peasants and serfs live in a world in which they are, uh, they have to, you know, do all this labor for their lords, they have to pay high fees to their lords, they feel oppressed and abused. And so many people view this, uh, you know, Protestant, Luther's ideas as the beginning of a revolution of society. And so the peasant rebellion happens in the 1520s in Germany, in the Holy Roman Empire, in Protestant areas, and these are peasants that are uprising against the restrictions of the nobles in these territories. Now Luther does not side with the peasants, and the reason why he doesn't side with the peasants is because Luther's religion and his own survival depends on the support of the princes, it depends on the support of the political hierarchy, not the emperor but all those other ones that have embraced him. Luther's own life was protected by the princes, so he, he owes his life to them. And Luther's religion is being, is, is being spread by princes as well. Luther calls upon these princes to reform the churches in their areas. And so the, church, the princes that do are creating this new Lutheran church. And so when these princes and other nobles are challenged by the peasants, Luther initially calls for caution, but then he rejects the peasant side. He calls them pigs. He rejects them outright. And he supports the quite ruthless oppression of the peasants that takes place to suppress the, the revolution. Okay, now these northern German, German princes, in order to protect themselves, form the Schmalkaldic League. Once again, the Schmalkaldic League is a union of northern German Lutheran princes to protect themselves from the Catholic emperor, Charles V. Now, Charles V is distracted by all sorts of issues. He's distracted by war with the Ottomans in the east. He's also fighting the Spanish Habsburgs down in Italy. And uh, he all... Uh, sorry... He, sorry, he's the Habsburg king. So he's also fighting the French down in Italy for control, and that's the whole Machiavelli situation that Machiavelli refers to in The Prince, the Spanish and the French armies fighting down there. 
So the Habsburg Emperor is dealing with problems in the East, he's dealing with problems in the South, and Francis I, the French king, also begins to finance, to fund the northern German princes. He helps them out as well. And so France's goal, as we noted uh, throughout the course, France's goal is to guarantee that the Holy Roman Empire, or the Germany, is weak and decentralized. Because if Germany is ever unified, there's more Germans than there are French, and therefore a strong Germany is a threat to France, right? And we see this in the 20th century, a unified Germany does represent a threat to France in World War I and World War II. So there's reason for them to be scared, although, you know, yeah. Uh, so, um, Charles V then and his Holy Roman Empire and these imperial forces begin to fight the Schmalkaldic League in the 1540s and 1550s. We've got a series of wars between the, the Catholic South and the Protestant princes of the North. And these wars are ended with the Peace of Augsburg. The Peace of Augsburg in 1555 states, Caius Regio, Eius Religio, or in other words, whose region his religion. And once again, whose region? His religion. The Peace of Augsburg allows two religions Catholicism, the traditional religion, or Lutheranism. Those are the two choices Catholicism or Lutheranism. It does not allow Anabaptism, it does not allow Calvinism. Lutheranism, Catholicism. Secondly, this does not mean religious toleration or religious freedom. Who's choosing? He who controls the region. The local prince chooses. So therefore, all the people in a principality, in a town, are going to follow whatever the leadership chooses. And they have to follow it. That is the official religion of that area. Okay. Now we can change our attention over to Switzerland. In Switzerland, there's also an uh, early Reformation. There, a priest named Zwingli begins to spread Luther's ideas. Zwingli emphasizes that the Bible should be taken literally. And so Zwingli has his first big disagreement with Luther. And the disagreement is about communion. Zwingli argues that communion is merely symbolic. There is no actual presence of Christ. That Christ is just saying this as a symbol. Luther argues that no, Christ is actually present in the Eucharist, in communion. It doesn't actually become his body physically, but he's actually present. Now, once again, who's going to decide what's true? This is the beginning of the split of the Protestant movement. And so, no one knows which one is true. Luther is his followers, Zwingli, Zwingli is his followers. And so what we're going to see is that Protestantism, therefore, is going to split between all these different branches as different thinkers come up with different religious doctrines. Now Zwingli is killed in a religious war amongst the Swiss cantons, uh, but in Geneva, shortly thereafter, a French pr religious reformer named John Calvin comes into, uh, comes and begins to assert his views. 